I'm going to start with a, a bit of my reminder, it just inspired me, Rachel, thank you. I wasn't going to read from that, but that's all, now I will. Um, I, I did a version of this um, reminder, partly to kind of have something of value in terms of my relationship, my past, my kind of Indian heritage, which has been a very vexed thing. Uh, and I, I kind of knew a version of it from when I was a child. My grandfather told me a version of it. And, and when I started doing some research for it, um, I came across, you know, the kind of Burmese version, Thai, Malaysian, Philippine, Nepalese versions. And I tried to infuse some of the energy of those into my version and try and get some of the kind of puppet show tradition, the graphic animation um, tradition of the, of the story. So try and get kind of, hopefully, hopefully you get a sense of that um, in this bit I'll read now. I mean, I've, I've done it as an epic, so, you know, action, reflection, action, in that, in that sense. And I've tried to keep to the basic storyline. And I've done this prologue where the gods have gone to complain against the baddie, Ravana. Okay? Um, interestingly, in North India, he's a deep, Ravana's a stock figure, he's a bad character. South India, they love him. Uh, he's a hero. The, you know, that kind of north south divide in India, but it's the other way around. The, the north is all powerful over there. Yeah. Anyway, so I, try, I, I present Ravana as a demon, bad, bad, bad character here. But I kind of sort of show other bits of them later on. So, yeah, called Get Ravana. Lord of the Cosmos Vishnu was brought back to heaven from his stellar meditation by many gods now stooped at his feet. Said one, semi stooped in the saffron light, O oh Lord, whilst we in thousand day prayers for peace are bent, Ravana is bishboshing our kingdoms. No wonder the gods were gurgling with collybobbles. Ravana was toasting their earthly and galactic worlds. But who was this scallywag, this Gunda? Lord of the cosmos Vishnu flashed umpteen visions to the gods that showed Ravana's path to glory. In the first flashback, Vishnu displayed Ravana being born with ten heads and ten pairs of arms. Then he showed Ravana, the teenager on a hillock, meditating for so many non-stop years that smoke was issuing from his head and dulling the heavens. No surprise, in Vishnu's next vision, Ravana was losing his mind and was holding a blade to cut off his own ten heads. Vishnu from on high stopped him by asking what he is wanting. Ravana boomed back. Am I not a worthy king of the universe, Lord? Vishnu must have hoped Ravana would become pure Shanti, a bit like himself. Yet soon as Vishnu's divine engine touched across each Ravana atom in a somewhat unparalleled way, Ravana went bonkers. His ten heads, his ten sets of arm, trapezoid, rump, knuckle or whatnot, jarred tsunami volcanically into a hardcore fierce burning up. His every milliage was muscling, pinnacling, with indestructibilityness. Stop that bit there. <laughs> so I might read one more section. Yes, I will. and the rest of the story takes place back on Earth. It's just that opening bit, but it's all on Earth. Um, I'm going to then sort of Vishnu's born on Earth as Rama, and he's been doing some demon fighting this stage, and he's sort of learnt how to try and control and harness his powers, not to destroy the earth. It's quite an interesting environmental story, I would say, well, the Ramayana. There's loads of, kind of uh, exploration of the environment in, in relation to power and state. In this bit, um, I, I took a, a balcony scene from a version that's about a thousand years old. And I, I love the idea of that, you know, that kind of somebody up there in the heavens, as it were, and Rama sees Sita for the first time, and he's down on earth. Um, and I did some research at the Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, did you have it? And I was looking at some early Indian jewellery there, and there were some toe rings, um, and these packs of ten toe rings, um, and all different sizes and shapes. Because, um, in very tradition, traditional circles, uh, women wear a toe ring to suit the personality of each toe. Very interesting. Uh, and partly because, you know, you're supposed to not look at the top half of the female. And in some versions of the Ramayana, uh, when Sita gets abducted, Hanuman, the monkey god, goes looking for Sita, uh, and he's only had a description of her toes from Rama. So he goes around looking at people's feet. 
I did take that version into mine. Um, I don't think it would have kind of worked in Britain. And in this bit, so Rama's with his brother Lakshmana, and they're, they're just resting after some demon slaying. So he's going to see his, his, his you know, beloved for the first time. So fan your imagination on the Yogyas look like Matilla, with its towers, turrets, domes, all golden or pastel. Rama and Lakshmana fanning their gaze on swings strapped to trees, swaying with couples. And nearby the girls wore a length of Kashoma cotton that whirled about the body and pointed to the S-type anklets, and pointed to the bell-topped toe ring on each toe. Each toe ring specially designed to suit that toe's darling Nian. And speaking a while longer of toe rings, some girls wore the cheeky cum rings that were double bosomed and filled with a tinsy knocker, dingling its own tantalizing tune. Hi hi. What's more, all girls strode about wondrously barefooted, all rehearsed love tunes or danced to soft gongons. No wonder Rama and Lakshmana smiled to the music of their hooting, their panting. And there, whilst below the stream, Rama's eyes lifted upwards, and there, across on a balcony, from where the cool breeze blew off the balmy sea, a woman in shining Horsham silk, with a spotted deer border, and with eyes brilliant as the lotus, and with her feet all of a sudden rooted, so she looked the double of the goddess Lakshmi. Rama's second take on, who is that? Is that the beauty of the world across on the balcony observing the jamboree? And her eyes fell according to the exact second of the cosmic dial that we call fate on Rama's eyes at the same time as Rama's phone startled upon hers. Their heartbeats doubled on the same count and hearkened in a shared breath. The harkening damsel was Sita. While Rama dazed at her beauty, Sita dazed at his, and thought to herself how this must be the veiled recognition that we call love at first sight. Together they had walked, eon after eon, fresh as bold new lovers, under the starry lanes in heaven, he as Vishnu and she as Lakshmi. T'was in this incarnation, under all the depredations a human endures, an elapsed memory being amongst our most humbling torments, through which each looked upon the other, a stranger. <coughs> okay, we'll move off that. And re I'll read a couple of pieces from my uh, book on the British Museum. I, I might start with a poem, in fact. I've got three long poems in this book, one about kind of that first generation of migrants who kind of, you know, came in the late 50s, who were sort of passing away, I want to kind of pay tribute to them, and a long one about the BBC, about a British voice, and this one about the museum. I was partly thinking about Britain's power within itself and its soft power around the world, and I want to think about how poetry can help me think, um, or artifacts and poetry help me think about uh, global politics. I'll read this first section, um, and I was partly thinking about you know, in the Great Dome in, in the museum, it's got those Norman Foster tiles, no two tiles are the same size, I thought it was interesting. And also when I started this poem, you could just walk in and out of the museum, now they've obviously got security checks, so when I mentioned that being quaint, I was partly thinking about that lovely freedom you had to walk in and through and across, it's all gone now. So this first section, is, it's quite a long poem, but we, I'll see how I'll get on with the first bit. So, Meditations on the British Museum, part one. I stand dead centre at the treasure core of our crowning jewels, our great court and noble casket. A backstreet, open-ended, Bloomsbury Bazaar, where every marvel migrant, in the four-wing, three-four stone, is guarded quaint. Come bask in our show of travels abroad, in millennia of civilization and handiwork as conceived by our fair isle. Look at our roof, each triangular pane uniquely sized to renew perspective. Our house of colonnaded counterthoughts, where my propositions are jots 
amidst a meandering crowd who extend dreams on a statue's nine lost body parts. Could this be a court for stock taking, a spare room to measure by upheld mirror our own silk goods and grave ills, our ideals? Step back. Who decided our taste? How did our sovereign palate come to be enlivened? Was it the native's grasp for each object that banked our praise? Did resemblance to Rome, to Athens, lay these goods far from the native halo to a pressurized soil where walls are postponed for an expanded space? Where visitors film all Mesopotamia or on a bend snap a sphinx, the essence of Phoenix. Each allegorical or tantric form shorn of its origin and tribal worship lords itself before its mild god, the British Museum. Inside the dome, a copper dome that's embraced by a green glass bridge, its columns facing each cafe and kiosk, a museum as nation, as a fragment of varnished Britannia, Britannica. Here are classrooms from Bermuda to Burma. Here's roads plotting red train lines to froth in steam a cheek of Africa. Or here the peoples in shell ornaments, chiefs, rajas, mounties, every parrot and howdered elephant stooped before Victoria. So in empire where compatriots lit pure as Bendigo, El Dorado. Okay. Re I'll read another section from that, and then I'll read one more poem after that, and we'll stop. So in this section, I'm going to think through poems, loads of poems, hopefully. Um, it's okay. So third section. And yeah, I guess one of, the, one of the things I did with this, and a few poems I've written about institutions, is I'll try and place myself in there and see if I can find a way out. And I'll only get out there in my imagination, the writing of it, or in the poem until I found a good conclusion. But I'm not going to read the conclusion, just in case it's not good enough. But I will read the section before. Yeah. Amazed by these time compacted rooms, I feel prompted for guidance out of the comfort zone of our myth kitty. I'd slip the radar of the panels relaying the ossified exchange of pats and goods. I'd stand each object in the dock, then with my poetic grounding, have it account for the applause awarded its opulence. I'd uproot my nice day out and sense who today deserves to be selflessly offended. This bare-tooth mask of Quetzalcoatl was bestowed on a god, Cortez. Does this mask dare us to face how paradise was lost? To face Montezuma, who was bound before Cortez and forced to witness from God's great Toledo sword an unprovoked genocide. I recall my screen reporting common or garden rapes, poisonings, dismemberments in our own suburbia. Shall I view each vile type of mind grappled as the bog bodies corpsing the museum? The bodies he delve to evidence a turf of manoeuvre, empathy, or try to decode the spirit of Yeats's resurrection, where his singing bird of Byzantium, high on its golden bough, tweets to a grandee news about an imminent agony by flame, till I am furrowed in hope on Homer's shield of Achilles its folk tilling the singing fields. To find lodged here too an aspect of Auden's grim shield, and ask how was the primal vision, how has the primal vision endured? Each man still works his plot, then prays before the sun. How long will they alter after winter, so their tool blooms bullets, body belts? The shield between heraldic harvest and the towering lands raised. So who rouses who for a higher tree of death? Surely their faith alone builds rooms of fresh ruin. Like dissonance in Forster's Marabar cave, what sound booms 
from these nooks, summoning each child to its Torah Bora dome, where an ordinance drones home. Is a Frankenstein fanatic for or against us while it reconstructs each blood? Could the museum help inter our old ideas of the outsider breeding amidst within us terms such as infidel, insurgent, vigilance? Is our world now plinth? Now Prospero, Prospero surveillance hoards our every scripted quip for the island of our interrogation. Here's a reminder statue of the demon Vibhishana, who betrayed his own kin to side with Rama, the foe purely for moral profit. When factions conflict nowadays, whose facts add up? Are today's Vibhishanas, Manning, Snowden, Assange? Okay, thank you for your patience. I'll read one more piece to finish. Uh, my, I was partly started really thinking about my, um, uh, one of my uncles. Um, he's got a leg disability. He left India when he was quite young and worked in the oil rigs in the Middle East, then ended up in, in Kamloops in, in Canada and worked at the sawmills there for a bit. Now he's lives in the Midlands. So, um, in his play, I imagine his wife's passed away and he's really thinking about the next, next life and, and yeah, the caste issues and stuff. So it's called The Vishnu of Wolverhampton. Oh, I mentioned chum chums or Indian sweets, very fluorescent pink Indian sweet, my head. I always be Lakshman the hobbler who leave the open sewer, the lemon trees at India's independence for the sawmills of Kamloops and onwards for the middle of the motherland till they joke how far a mere hobbler has stretched his legs from one to the other end of the British world. So what can it mean returning home? Yet, only yesterday, I see a pink cloud lost. And though I never before, I wave to it. I think it is my wife Padma, who passed away a life ago. Padma come from the homeland to, to check if I hang out my washing. When I point to my handkerchiefs on the line, she is a beaming cloud with silk lining. I always dream of the marriage night with Padma, how we before have never met, how we're locked in our bedroom by the villagers and the young girls in bare feet who are all huddled and listening from the veranda, how I'm trying to stand up proper, man-like, but outside is all one ear, even the jackal, jackal is quiet and ready to laugh, and my bride stays sitting on the side of our bed-to-be. She is a stick, a bizarre candy pink. From head to toe, I feel in my heart she is pure, too pure. And not very man-like am I, when I drop my judo and out come sticking my legs, my hobbledy boy legs. But my bride, loosen her sari and calm as Mother India, come to bed, husband, I will love your legs. Your legs are now my legs. And in our love trying and chuckling, she understands why I start to cry. I cry, I love so much my father. To win a wife for his cursed son, he become a man on his knees. And when he come up from the begging ground, he come up holding this Padma jewel. She is a goddess, I swear, for any Raja. But is happy with only Lakshman the hobbler. These days, I am widowed white haired. And all my family have passed away, cloud cut for the monsoon mansions. In my dreams of Vishnu, I am ready to leave this skin for other skins. My friend ran watch and say, All oh, gods is dead, it always bastard rain. I say, My dear Ran you're always coming up dry in the eyes of our partition peoples. Did we not have kismet of Rajas? Why are you expecting Wolverhampton a heat wave? Only this I pray. On my last day, my peoples will light my sandalwood pyre. From my flaming body at dawn, my soul is rising and, ri and become a pink cloud, flying to India, where my Padma is also a pink cloud hovering for me. 
just before our watering down into all-time waters, for a long time no one seeing us moment, above a bankside, above a fork tree, where the gods once straightened a crippled child, Padma and I will come together, one double big, chum chum pink, chuckling cloud. Thank you very much, thank you.